Good evening and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm your host, Noel Okel. And we're back for another week of the latest behind-the-scenes news and stories directly from the Vatican. And since our last episode, there's been a lot of interesting things that have happened in Rome, so let's jump right in. Here are just some of the stories that we bring you on tonight's show. World Youth Day fever is starting to rise, and we'll tell you what the Pope did to throw some fuel into the fire. A skeleton found at the Vatican Embassy appears unrelated to the 35-year-old mysterious disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. They appear to be related, however, to an even older mystery. Christmas decorations are popping up all over the place, and the Vatican is no exception. We have some interesting insight on how the yearly nativity scene at St. Peter's all began. And also, we go back in time and look at some of the more interesting events that happened this week in the history of the Vatican. I have all those stories and more here on Vatican Connections up next, so be sure to stay tuned. Okay, let's start with a quick look at some of the main headlines coming from the Vatican over the weekend, starting with the Pope's Angelus Address on Sunday. And on Sunday, the Pope addressed the crowds after his weekly recitation of the Angelus and spoke about the Solemnity of Christ the King. The Holy Father said that Jesus came to earth to establish an eternal kingdom for us, one which is founded on love, and one that gives us peace, freedom, and the fullness of life. Here's a quick summary from CNS. Jesus wants to capire che that di sopra del potere politico c'è n'è un altro molto più grande che non si consegue con mezzi umani. Lui è venuto sulla terra per esercitare questo potere che è l'amore, rendendo testimonianza alla verità. Si tratta della verità divina che in definitiva è il messaggio essenziale del Vangelo. Dio è amore e vuole stabilire nel mondo il suo regno di amore, di giustizia e di pace. La storia ci insegna che i regni fondati sul potere delle armi e sulla prevaricazione sono fragili e prima o poi crollano. Ma il regno di Dio è fondato sul suo amore e si radica nel cuore. Il regno di Dio si radica nei cuori conferendo a chi lo accoglie pace, libertà e pienezza. Tutti noi vogliamo pace, tutti noi vogliamo libertà e vogliamo pienezza. E come mai si fa? Lascia che l'amore di Dio, il regno di Dio, l'amore di Gesù si radichi nel tuo cuore e avrai pace, avrai libertà, as you may already know, the Pope has summoned to Rome this February the presidents of every bishop conference from around the world, including all the heads of the Eastern Rite churches, specifically to discuss the prevention of clergy sex abuse and the protection of minors on a global scale. This meeting of church leadership of more than 100 bishop conferences from around the world is believed to be the first of its kind. It signals the realization at the highest levels of the church that clerical sex abuse is a global problem and not one just restricted to the Anglo-Saxon world, as many church leaders have previously thought. Now, who proposed this February meeting and what will it cover? Well, details are now just surfacing and it turns out that the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors under Cardinal Sean O'Malley had originally proposed it and subsequently accepted by the Holy Father. There is a lot of speculation at the moment as to what exactly the four meetings will cover. Will we see some strict guidelines or policy designed to keep bishops accountable? 
or perhaps universally prescribed punishments for the cover-ups or clergy abuse? Well, the reality is, at this point in time, no one actually knows. The only thing we know for certain are these facts. This meeting will be of a synodal nature, meaning they'll consist of many open discussions, reflections, and work groups. At some point, a report will be generated. Our sources have confirmed that the Pope will be present at every single work session, and we certainly know that the Holy Father has now made the protection of minors a fundamental priority for the Universal Church. And of course, I'll keep you up to date as more information becomes available in the upcoming weeks. At the Pope's weekly general audience last Wednesday, the Holy Father greeted thousands of pilgrims gathered at St. Peter's Square, where he continued his catechesis on the Ten Commandments, focusing on that day on the final two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Here now is a quick summary of the Pope's message from that day. The following is a summary of the Holy Father's words this morning. Dear brothers and sisters, in our continuing catechesis on the Ten Commandments, we now turn to the final commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. These last commandments, in some sense, sum up the entire content of the Decalogue. For all sin, as Jesus teaches, is ultimately born of covetousness the evil desires that lurk in the human heart. The Ten Commandments, by teaching us how to live rightly with one another and with God, show us our need for a liberating change of heart that can only be received through the gift of the Holy Spirit. They invite us to abandon our self-seeking and the illusion of our self-sufficiency and to acknowledge our need for salvation. The humble recognition of our spiritual poverty thus opens our hearts to God's mercy, which transforms and renews us, enabling us to live righteous lives in the sight of the Father, redeemed by the Son and taught by the Holy Spirit. In this way, we learn to show to others the mercy that we ourselves have received in Christ. Okay, so here's an interesting story. It turns out that the most speculated cold case in modern Vatican history will continue to remain for now just that, an unsolved mystery. Now, you may recall the story we brought you two weeks ago about the discovery in October of a fully intact female skeleton found inside the Vatican Embassy in Italy. The grisly discovery led to the sensationalized speculation that the remains could be those of Emanuela Orlandi, the 15-year-old daughter of a Vatican employee who mysteriously disappeared, presumably kidnapped in 1983. Well, it turns out that sources close to the case have told the media that the bones are too old to be related to the Orlandi case. At this point, the main hypothesis is that the bones found in the Vatican building appear to be more than 100 years old. It turns out, interestingly enough, that the Vatican Embassy was in fact built on top of an old cemetery, which supports the theory that the remains belong to a person who had been buried there. Carbon dating on the remains will begin this Friday to confirm that hypothesis. And so it seems that the mysterious disappearance of Emanuel Orlandi at the Vatican will remain for now another mystery.
So 2019 is shaping up to be a very busy year for the Pope, starting with a papal journey to Panama for the much-anticipated World Youth Day in January. The organizers of the event released last week the details of the Pope's agenda during his upcoming visit. When the Pope visits Panama for World Youth Day in January, it will be his 26th trip outside of Italy. He'll arrive in Panama on January 23rd, where his welcoming officially begins. The Holy Father will first greet, the next day, government officials at the palace, followed by a meeting with the diplomatic corps, then with the Central American bishops. Later that evening on the 24th, the official welcoming and the commandments of World Youth Day begins. The following days will consist of various appearances and liturgies, including a meeting with young people who are not able to attend, some in jail and some living with HIV. On Saturday the 26th, the Pope will celebrate Mass with priests, religious and lay movements of that country. Then in the evening, a vigil with the youth at Metro Park. The main World Youth Day Mass will be held on the 27th at the St. John the Paul II Field in Metro Park, followed by the farewell ceremony later on that evening and then an overnight flight back to Rome. Now with all the growing excitement around World Youth Day heating up, the Pope himself threw some fuel into the fire with an unexpected video message that he had sent to all the young pilgrims preparing for the event. He reminded them that the theme of the event is, I am the servant of the Lord, may I be done to me according to your word. Have a look. Queridos jóvenes, nos aproximamos a la Jornada Mundial de la Juventud que se celebrará en Panamá el próximo mes de enero y tiene como lema la respuesta de la Virgen María a la llamada de Dios. He aquí la sierva del Señor, hágase en mí según tu palabra. Sus palabras son un sí valiente, generoso, el sí de quien ha comprendido el secreto de la vocación, salir de uno mismo y ponerse al servicio de los demás. Nuestra vida solo encuentra significado solo encuentra significado en el servicio a Dios y a los demás. Hay muchos jóvenes creyentes y no creyentes que al final de una etapa de estudios muestran su deseo de ayudar a otros, de hacer algo por los que sufren, porque la pasan mal. Esa es la fuerza de los jóvenes, la fuerza de todos ustedes, la que puede cambiar el mundo. Esta es la revolución que puede desbaratar los grandes poderes de este mundo. La revolución del servicio. Ponerse al servicio de los demás no significa solamente estar listos para la acción, sino que también hay que ponerse en diálogo con Dios, en actitud de escucha, como lo hizo María. Ella escuchó lo que el ángel le decía y después respondió. De ese trato con Dios en el silencio del corazón se descubre la propia identidad y la vocación a la que el Señor llama. Esta puede expresarse en diferentes formas, en el matrimonio, en la vida consagrada, en el sacerdocio. Nunca al egoísmo. No existe la vocación al egoísmo. Todas las vocaciones son modos para seguir a Jesús. Lo importante es descubrir lo que el Señor espera de nosotros y ser valientes para decir sí. María fue una mujer feliz porque fue generosa ante Dios y se abrió al plan que tenía para ella. Las propuestas de Dios para nosotros como la que le hizo a María, no son para apagar sueños, sino para encender deseos, para hacer que nuestra vida fructifique y haga brotar muchas sonrisas y alegre muchos corazones. Dar una respuesta afirmativa a Dios es el primer paso para ser feliz y hacer felices a muchas personas. Queridos jóvenes, anímense a entrar cada uno en su interior. Entrar y decirle a Dios, ¿qué quieres de mí? Dejen que el Señor les hable y ya verán 
vuestra vida transformada y colmada de alegría. Ante la inminente Jornada Mundial de la Juventud de Panamá, los invito a que se preparen siguiendo y participando en todas las iniciativas que se están llevando a cabo. Les ayudarán a ir caminando hacia esa meta. Que la Virgen María los acompañe, que ella esté cerca de ustedes en este peregrinaje y que su ejemplo los anime a ser valientes y generosos en su respuesta. Buen camino hacia Panamá y por favor no se olviden de rezar por mí. Hasta pronto. And it's that time of year again. Christmas decorations are starting to pop up wherever you look. And it's certainly no exception at the Vatican. In a couple of days, St. Peter's Square will be adorned with a beautiful Christmas tree and a nativity scene, which has become a long-standing tradition. Every year, pilgrims get a chance to admire the decorations, which every year tells a different story. Our very own Emily Callan has more details on the significance of the Christmas decorations at the Vatican and how it all began. The Christmas tree, in fact, arrived at the Vatican last Thursday. It is 23 meters high, five meters shorter than last year's Christmas tree. But no matter its size, a crane is always required to hoist the tree into place. This year, the 4.5 ton red fir tree came from the forest of Cancillo in Poldenone, a region in northern Italy. The tree will be officially lit on December 7th during a lighting ceremony and will remain in St. Peter's Square until January 13th. Pope John Paul II started the tradition of decorating St. Peter's Square for Christmas. It was a custom the saint had been familiar with back in Poland, a custom also practiced in other parts of Northern Europe. So in 1982, the first ever Christmas tree was erected at the Vatican. It was a gift from a Polish farmer. Since that time, the tree has always been donated from a different region in Europe. Last year, the tree once again hailed from the Archdiocese of Elk in Poland, which coincided with the 35th anniversary of the Vatican Christmas tree, and its decorations were made by children receiving treatment in Italian hospitals. A life-size nativity scene will also accompany the tree. This time, surprisingly, the nativity scene is being sculpted out of sand. In recent years, Vatican nativity scenes were made up of Neapolitan or Maltese figures. So four artists began building the sand sculpture one week ago. They are using 700 tons of sand. The sand comes from an Italian mountain range called the Dolomites. These artists, however, are famous for their sand sculptures. They've been doing it for years in the town of Gesolo in Italy. The final touches will be brought to the nativity scene a couple days before the big reveal, scheduled at the same time as the unveiling of the Christmas tree. Last year, during a meeting with those who participated in the Vatican's Christmas display, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, told them, Every year, the Christmas nativity scene and tree speak to us through their symbolic language. They make more visible what is captured in the experience of the birth of the Son of God. And he added, the crib is the evocative place where we contemplate Jesus, who, taken upon himself human misery, invites us to do the same through acts of mercy. And finally tonight, we go back in time and look at some of the major historical events that happened at the Vatican this week. In the year 799 AD, Pope Leo III returned to Rome on November 29th under the protection of Charlemagne, the King of the Franks. He fled Rome after being attacked and almost killed by partisans of the late Pope Adrian I. Charlemagne arbitrated the dispute and restored Pope Leo to the papal office, after which the King of the Franks was subsequently crowned as the Roman Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire on Christmas Day in the year 800. Also this week in Rome, 120 years ago actually, on November 24, 1898, the International Conference of Rome for the Social Defense Against Anarchists began. 
This highly secretive conference was primarily called as a result of the assassination of Empress Elizabeth of Austria. 54 delegates from 21 different countries agreed to set up a special organization for the surveillance of those suspected of anarchisms. Many historians argue that this gathering was the beginning of what we now know as Interpol. Ironically, however, eight years later on November 18, 1906, an anarchist bomb exploded inside St. Peter's Basilica during the anniversary dedication of the Basilica to St. Peter. The Los Angeles Herald reported that no one was injured and nothing damaged. Some say it was because of the sheer size of the Basilica, while others claim that it was nothing short of a miracle. Nevertheless, those responsible have never been caught or found. And all of that happened this week in the history of the Vatican. And that's our show for this week. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's story. So why not send us some of your thoughts on our Facebook page or Twitter at saltandlighttv.org. I'm Noel Okuland. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next